Uh, good morning. This is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting of January 18th. Good morning, everyone. We have some work before us today. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to comment on the mask requirement bill that we have been looking at. And leadership continues to discuss the path forward for that bill. It was scheduled for this morning, but we're going to postpone our work and hopefully it'll be only until tomorrow morning. We'll keep you posted. Um, and I've, I'm, I'm asking uh, Ledge Council to just go through the draft for spelling or similar changes so that when we do come back to it, um, we're ready to go. So that's it on the mass requirement bill. And we're going to move on into our agenda to um, S74. And I believe Jen Carby, you are here. Good morning. Good morning. It's, yeah, it's good to see you and everyone else. You as well. Um, so we, we have had testimony on S74, and I know that there are folks out uh, who have been, continued to send emails uh, about the bill. Um, so we're going to just move forward with what we have at this point. I haven't heard for further testimony uh, to, at this time. So Jen, we're going to go through the bill, and I know that you've had conversations with folks who testified on the bill, and we'll look and see what that conversation has led to, if anything. So are we still at the So close? I have not actually spoken with anyone, I don't believe. I had reached out to the Attorney General's office, but did not hear back, um, okay. and I have reached out to um, DIVA to try to get some information about Medicaid coverage, but have not. Uh, I, as I understand well. it, uh, the insurance issue ha is is fine as taken care of. So, I so I don't think we need to follow up with that one. The one that I'm most concerned about is charities uh, from the AG's office. So, let's go through the bill and then um, we can get to decision points as needed. Uh, Senator Cummings. Yeah. The thing I heard the other day that I'd just like to check on is that there's been some issue with getting the medications and that some of the medications haven't been um, working as planned or as people thought they would. And I just thought we might want to so yeah, I'm well, here's what I'm going to make yeah, sure I, everything's in line. I've heard that as well. The most of the emails I've gotten about that have been from out of state and from uh, organizations out of state. I think this that, apparently was Grand Rounds at UVM. So oh, that one. Yep, I saw that one as well. Um, so what I'm going to suggest is we go through the bill with the technical corrections that have been substantiated with data yeah. from uh, the program itself. The medication issue gets into a bigger discussion that I, I think in some ways falls outside of what we might be able to accomplish uh, at this time. So I understand it's an issue and perhaps we could suggest to the Department of Health and others that they uh, evaluate those medications. Um, it seems like a medical decision. So uh, let's let's go through the bill and then we'll see where we get to. Do you want me to put the bill up on the screen or do you want to be looking I at it? I think so. Yeah, let's put it up on the screen. Then we're all looking at it the same place, the same time, and we can uh, make draw our conclusions as needed. Right. Thank you, Aaron has made me co-host. All right, so here is the bill. Can you all see that now? Yes. Great. So this is S74, um, an act relating to modifications to Vermont's patient choice at end of life laws. And the first changes in, are in section one of the bill, it would amend 18 BSA section 5283 which is um, the list of items, a list of actions that must occur in order for a physician not to be subject to liability or disciplinary action. Um, and the first of those 
deals with the patient making the oral request to the physician in the physician's physical presence. And the proposal here is to eliminate that. Um, and, and I think there are a couple of options. You had heard about some talk about telemedicine being appropriate. Um, so one option might be to, to specify that this can be done through telemedicine. Um, otherwise, it, it does not require any physical, uh, I'm sorry, any um, visual contact between the patient and the provider. Um, so it, I think if you take out the language, it would allow a telephone call as well as um, as well as audio video. And if you have a, a preference there, then we may want to specify. Madam Chair. Go ahead. Jen, I think, thank you. I think that's a good suggestion, um, particularly given the testimony we received last week from Dr. Barnard, who described what she does to assess a patient. Um, so if, if you're able to add that in, I think that would be helpful. Where exactly, what, can you just share with us where exactly that goes in the process, the overall process? Th these requests? Mm -hmm. um, so this is, um, well, th there are requirements for this process to occur that the, the patient make two oral requests to the physician at least 15 days apart um, for the medication. And then, um, and there are other things that, uh, that occur throughout the process, but aren't necessarily um, happening at the same, at that same time. Um, so where it would, so this would add language within number two or number so to add one? language in number, numbers one, one and two. Okay presumably, um, and then, and similarly take out language requiring this physical examination. Um, right, it's already happened. Well, it, it, if, so with the language that is proposed here, I believe the entire um, physician patient interaction with respect to um, this part of the process may happen without a physical examination. There is earlier and just in the definition of bona fide physician patient relationship in the chapter, um, a requirement that the there be a treating or consulting relationship in the course of which a physician has completed a full assessment of the patient's medical history and current medical condition, including a personal physical examination. Yes, that's exactly what I was getting at. So we're not look we're we're looking at that established relationship, and then this is at a time when the patient may have difficulty in getting and transporting him or herself to the physician's office, among other things. Okay, right. Yeah, thank you, Senator Cummings. Yeah, but we we're, we're allowing a um teleconferencing, not just the telephone call. Is that correct? Yes, I think well, that's what that's what you're discussing is yes. um, so with with the I, I language is proposed. Yeah, I would be uncomfortable with just a phone call. Um, yeah, I think I, and give it or Senator Cummings, given the testimony we heard last week from Dr. Barnard, I think specifying that in the physician's physical presence or via video telehealth, right. is what I, I think, think makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I will note, I just, uh, as I'm reading you, it was reading you this definition of bona fide physician patient relationship that, that requires a physical examination. That term is actually never used in the chapter. I think it's a holdover from earlier drafts of the, um, of the bill when Act 39 was in process. So there may not necessarily have been a person, a physical examination of the patient if you eliminate um, this requirement about the terminal condition being based on a physician's physical examination of the patient. So in other areas, the decision, um, you know, for other medical procedures, the decision is up to the doctor when 
uh, when and in what form the telemedicine communication would take place or be appropriate. So I'm thinking maybe that is a better, uh, maybe that's language that we could use to say, um, as for other medical procedures, it is up to the doctor to decide when and in what form telemedicine is appropriate. Throw um, that out. Well, we, we may want to look at the laws and I'm just pulling up the statutes on our uh, statute in also in title 18, 9361, I believe is where uh, it talks about telemedicine generally um, and the duties for healthcare providers. And there's, you know, there's oral, there's um, consent required. I'm just, I'm, I don't think it specifies there was language when you worked on the audio only telephone coverage last year that talked about being clinically appropriate for telemedicine. I don't believe that or for, for audio only telephone. I don't believe that same language exists in, um, in your telemedicine law around the healthcare provider side of it. It may exist in the insurance coverage piece. Okay. Um, so if there's a particular, I guess what I'm saying is if there's a particular message that you're wanting to convey about telemedicine, then, then let's be explicit about it, but I wouldn't tie it to other types of, uh, to what's specified elsewhere in statute, because I'm not sure it is specified elsewhere in statute. So if you want to say it. something in here about if, you know, the provider determining it is clinically appropriate to do this by telemedicine, I think that's fine. We can certainly put that in there and that might be the right terminology. That, that makes sense. So what, are, what do you think about that committee? Where are you talking about specifically? Where, where um, we were, and, we were and, up at one and two, I think. And Jen, could yes. you just mm -hmm. tell me which chapter the, the medical aid and dying is in, in Title 18 I'm trying to find? Yes, it's 113. Mm -hmm. 113, okay. Yep. Uh, uh, so Jen, I'm so, looking so at section something one. like, whoops, I, now I went too far. Um, made an oral request. So something like the patient made an oral request to the physician and the physician's physical presence or, um, or using or by telemedicine as defined in our other telemedicine statute. Um, if the physician determines telemedicine is clinically appropriate do we want to say anything about what form of telemedicine is clinically appropriate? Well, we're going to use telemedicine. So we're not using telehealth. Okay. That's the okay. larger we're using term. Telemed, that can, so, yep, got it. Right. So telemedicine, and I would recommend that we that we tie in the definition from actually Title VIII that gets um, carried over into the telemedicine healthcare provider statute. Um, that's that defines it as the live audio, live synchronous audio video. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So uh, let's do that. Let's put that in and see how that, how that looks to okay. us. Yes. And I want to spend a little time sort of looking at the language and how best to phrase it. So oh, it's not, <clears throat> I'm not loving what I'm, how I'm saying it now. So I'll look at how to <laughs> phrase it so that I think it captures what you're saying. And we get it. Jen, okay. I did. I am looking now at Chapter One Thirteen. There is a definition of bona fide physician-patient relationship in that. There is, but that term is then not used again in the chapter. Oh, I see. Okay. So it defines it, but it doesn't actually come up. So the definition doesn't it is sort of irrelevant. I, um, I think it was just a holdover for. There were a lot of different versions and approaches being drafted when Act Thirty Nine was was a bill in the legislature. Um, and I think that was just a, a holdover from an earlier version that did not end up in the final. Okay, so let's try that. And then we'll look at the new improved language from Ledge Council Carby. <laughs> and uh, so, and then we, why don't we move up, move along? That's a good, okay. a, a good, a point well made. Um, and I know there was an issue, and I think David Englander had, had largely addressed this 
at the time, but there was an issue raised about whether there's a concern around telemedicine and whether providers are, whether it's an out of state provider. Um, based on our definition of healthcare provider, it is somebody who is licensed in the state. And in addition, a provider has to be licensed in the state, except right now during COVID where, as you know, um, there, there is the option for out of state, licensed out of state providers to provide treatment to Vermont patients without being licensed in the state. Otherwise, there is a requirement that the provider be licensed in the state where the patient is physically located. Um, so I don't think there's anything additional you need to do there when, when we're under normal circumstances, unless there's something that you want to specify in this particular COVID time. No, I think the, uh, the place that for that be... would be in the COVID bill, if right. at all. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the... Those are the changes in one and two and the other and subdivisions one and two. The other change here is, is really a technical one from just a grammatical one from no fewer to not fewer. Um, and then in number five, this is removing that requirement that the um, physician have done a physical examination of the patient to determine that the patient is suffering a terminal condition. This is uh, a, re a requirement for an examination and a review of the patient's medical relevant medical records, but does not require the patient to be physically examined by the, this prescribing provider. Well, Jen, so there, that would take place prior to the other two via telemed or, or potentially be a via telemed, right? This would be like the initial exam. Is that correct? Um, it could, there, it does not specify the timing. Um, in which the provider is making this deter, the physician is making this determination. Um, so there are a number of steps that have to occur, but other than um, the 15, at least 15 days between the oral requests, um, also a written request, um, and then the, we'll look at it in a minute, the 48 hours for the, for the physician to write the prescription, it doesn't specify the order in which these have to occur. So I think arguably you could have the physician or the, the patient make the first oral request, the physician do, do make the determination that the patient is suffering a terminal condition and other things um, at that, you know, at, at that time or after that time, but they have to have made this determination before they write the prescription. Okay. And And there, you know, it, and it may be difficult to see some of this out of context. This is this yeah, bill yeah, that, is just that, showing you the, yeah, the that, high that's points. That's one of the what's things changing. that is difficult. Is it's a, it is out of context, so it's helpful. Yep. Do you want me to you're... put up the statute? No, not right now. Be... Let's keep going, right. and and then we'll get we'll ask we'll continue to ask questions of to clarify. Um, okay. But it might be helpful at some point to go through the process again. The statute. Right. Okay, um, so that's where the physical, other physical examination piece comes in. And then this is, and I know you took a lot of testimony on this, number 12 is the requirement that the physician um, waited at least 48 hours after the last to occur uh, of the patients, and you can't see these, but, but um, this is the last to occur of the physician's written, uh, sorry, the patient's written request for medication the patient's second oral request and the physician offering the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. So that's the 48 hour waiting period that you have heard about um, after the, the oral request, the patient's second oral request is I think what people have been um, focusing in on. And, uh, but, and but eliminate that 48 hours. Yeah, but the 48 hours comes after the 15 days. So they made the right. request and then there was 15 days and then there are 48 hours after that, after the- Right, and actually at the time of the second oral request under the existing law, and this would not change, the physician has to offer the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. Oh, okay, that's right. So, and it's, so this is 48 hours, at least 48 hours after the last to occur of the 
patient making the written request, the patient making the second oral request, and the physician offering the patient an opportunity to rescind that request. So the question is, do you want 48 hours to, to have elapsed after the last of those before the physician writes the prescription, or do you want some lesser amount of time? Jen, just to clarify here, I'm, I'm looking at the, the statutes too, just because it's hard to track on the bill, but mm -hmm. um, it is an or, not an and. and it I is. Does, do you it, think I think it doesn't, I think it doesn't, I, as I've been looking through this, I've been thinking, oh, I wonder why it says or and not, yeah. and. I don't think it, I don't think it matters. Um, I mean, it's still the last to occur of the following events. So it still requires all of them to have, I, I believe, to have occurred. Um, I think it's confusing the way it's written. So, um, but my recollection of, of the discussion uh, and the way the process has, has works um, is that it's the last to occur of all of those. I think that the or is there to identify that, that um, only one of them would be the last. Okay. So, but so you I, think but it's I okay. agree that it is confusing. Yeah. <laughs> I read it three times to say, okay, yeah. there, does this make a difference if it's an and or an or, or should there even be a, a word there? A con conjunction. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, I think uh, it, I, I think it does not matter. I think the, the, um, Impact, the effect is the same, but it would be clearer if it's at hand. Can I make a suggestion sure. for everyone? I, so we all have our computer screens up. If you have your iPad, you're not using that separately. If you go to January 12th and under Betsy Walkerman, you click on the graphic, graphic act flow, uh, flow chart and it shows the... Um, the process so oh, great yeah but there it is so it's something to to look at in addition to looking at the statute that uh, Ruth is looking at I just want to make sure that there's not something else that we should clarify um, yeah. to make it more clear and that's why I was wondering about the and or the or <laughs> the and good. and the or the or the and yeah <laughs> good catch so what did you decide Jen what did you and Ruth decide on that one I think, I think it would be clear if it said and. I'm not sure if you want to make that, you know, if that's something that you want to address, I'm happy to make the change. Well, let's put it in and then we'll see what happens okay. with it. Um, I will, um, yes, I'll consult with David Englander too and see if he has a, a sense for okay. whether there's a practical effect there. I don't believe there is. Um, but I think it is clear with an and. So that is the end of section, the changes, proposed changes to section one, or in section one to this 18 BSA 5283. Is there anything else you wanted to look at on that section or do you want to Move on to section two. Let's just keep going, I think. Okay. Section two adds to um, the limitations on actions. So in the existing law, um, there are provisions around no, no provider being under any duty to participate in providing this medication to patient. Um, and that a healthcare facility or healthcare provider cannot subject a healthcare um, professional to discipline, suspension, loss of license, loss or privileges, or other penalty for actions taken in good faith reliance on the provisions of the chapter or refusals to act under the chapter. Um, and then there are, except as otherwise provided in a few other sections, nothing in this chapter shall be construed to limit liability for civil damages resulting from negligent conduct or intentional misconduct by any person. Um, and this would add in as a new C, so that would move down to D and this bill in section two 
would add that no person shall be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of the chapter. Um, so in existing 5285B, it's really focused on not subjecting a healthcare professional to professional disciplinary action for actions taken in good faith reliance on the provisions of the chapter or refusals to act. And this would add that nobody would be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action, which in some ways um, uh, overlaps with what's already in there for the healthcare professionals uh, for acting in good faith compliance. Okay. Um, then it, you haven't uh, recontacted uh, the AG's office again regarding this, but they have they not were, heard back from them. No, haven't heard back from them. So uh, silence is silence. Um, my concern is if we start listing all the different possibilities here, it gets extremely complex. So um, for this, this really um, is very helpful as far as I'm concerned, but I, I'm open to others. And I think the concern you'd heard from the Attorney General's office, and this is the piece I, I don't have enough uh, information about what their concern is, but is, a, is about this good faith compliance uh, which they suggested was introducing a new element, although I will um, point out again that 5285 already has, uh, B already has good faith reliance as far as the professional disciplinary action, but not the liability. And then um, this D uh, does not limit liability for civil damages if somebody is acting negligently or with intentional misconduct, then that um, generally would not you know, it is incompatible with good faith compliance. So if, it, if they're acting negligently or in, with intentional misconduct, that is not. Uh, and and the other, compliance. you know, the other, the thing that we heard in testimony was that there's one pharmacist who's willing to prescribe because of a concern about liability issues. So this- right, and so one possibility, if you were concerned about the breadth of this, would be to um, to include, or, or to I guess, well, I guess subsection B includes other person as well. But we could name no physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other person, um, which I think would keep would I guess would not narrow the breadth of it, um, but would specifically name pharmacists if that is part of the concern mm -hmm. currently around liability. I think that is a concern. So committee, I'm just asking what your thoughts are on that phrase. Medical provider, nurse, pharmacist. I think that the way, the way, we ha the way it's there is better because if we start listing somebody, we might leave somebody out. And then if you leave somebody out, then they might get worried that they're left out and could- well, The existing know. language in B is physician, nurse, pharmacist or other person. So it's still, so if you use that same language in C of physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other person, I don't think you're leaving anybody out. Okay, um, fair, okay. So what's wrong with doing that? How, but but it, I mean, there's, there's no, from a practical standpoint, it's no different from saying no person. You're just yeah. specifying some particular people. And the only reason you might wanna do that is if it gave more comfort to pharmacists if that's you know one of the well, it does offer groups clarity. You're looking to, yeah, it does offer yeah, clarity. You're looking to assuage. Uh, Senator Hooker, sure. thank you. Um, when Dr. Barnard spoke, she spoke about the health team, the the healthcare team, and I had asked you know who that included. That so I don't know if that is something that we might consider rather than no person. Well, we'd have to define health team, but I'm not sure that, Jen, is there a def definition of that anywhere? No, no, I think yeah, it's a different health term of art in the industry. She did suggest that it was anyone who was, you know, taking care of the right. patient. So, and that I think is an important pharmacist. concept that so, anyone who is in, you know, anyone who's in charge of yeah. person's health care should be protected if this person is making the decision. Okay, Senator Cummings. 
Okay. Maybe we could do something like healthcare professionals and pharmacists. Any person, there's been a concern about potential abuse and any person might be read to include those people that there was concern about might be pressuring people. Um, any person is pretty broad. Any professional person might cover it. Um, but I don't think, uh, to me, the pharmacist isn't part of the healthcare team. Healthcare is doctors, nurses, palliative care people, hospice personnel, but the pharmacist is in a shop 20 miles down the road and isn't part, you know, there's not like he's discussing with them what's the best medication. So I think we need to, to specifically mention pharmacists. So the language that Jen put forward, and I'm thinking that currently with this language in the, in the act, we haven't seen uh, concerns of abuse, you know, or, or liab liability issues raised. So by putting that phrase in here, it does offer reassurance for uh, the pharmacists and others, and it's consistent with what's in the underlying um, statute. So there is a definition in the <clears throat> beginning of the chapter of healthcare provider, which is, um, which is a, a version of one that we often use um, to, um, you know, we often use in statute. It's a person, partnership, corporation, facility, or institution licensed or certified or authorized by law to administer health care or dispense medication in the ordinary course of business or practice of a profession. So we could, if you wanted to, to keep it narrower, we could say a health care provider or no health care provider shall be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action. Um, I will note this definition of healthcare provider specifies dispense, dispensing medication, which is what a pharmacist does. Although generally in our, our larger use of the term healthcare provider typically does include, or healthcare professional does include a pharmacist um, in, that, in that category. So while they may not be physically present or part of what may be contemplated as the healthcare team, um, they are delivering a healthcare service so we could include healthcare provider. Um, I think that definition of healthcare provider is actually more broad <laughs> because it includes uh, institutions, um, et cetera. And I, I don't necessarily want to do that. Um, so I, I think um, I understand, Anne, your concerns about the, the other person in B, in the current law, that's talking about licensure or loss of licensure privilege. So that would be only covering licensed people. But um, I'm just wondering, Jen, for example, if a spouse were present, um, you know, during the whole process, which I think is, is common, um, would, if we didn't include other, per other person in, in the list, would the spouse potentially be liable or could? No, because of this previous section. So section 5284 is, is no duty to aid. Oh, and because okay. exactly what you're talking about was, was raised as a concern during the, the development of this legislation. Um, and so that specifies that, that being present, just by being present when somebody self-administers or not the medication or not acting to prevent the patient himself administering um, does not subject them to civil or criminal liability. Okay. So in that case, then if we said, if we did undersee what Senator Cummings, I think is suggesting um, the, instead of saying no person saying a physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other medical professional, I guess, shall be subject to with that. Is that what you're thinking, Anne? Yeah, I think we need to, 
to the issue has been pharmacists, and I think we need to re to specifically mention them because they are not generally, in my mind, I don't see them as healthcare workers. Right, but to not leave it open to anybody, anybody, else. yeah, right. anybody. Does does that make sense, Jen, or is that? Yes, I do want to be you know I do think. Uh, I don't want to get into a, a debate about it. I do think health, uh, pharmacists are typically considered to be a healthcare professional. Um, it's just as opposed to being in some other field. Um, but I, I certainly think we can specify no physician, nurse, pharmacist. If you want some kind of, of or other something, I think we're going to need to define what that category is. Um, yeah, maybe. And, you know, to use healthcare provider. <laughs> well, we don't necessarily. I think we can, um, you know, I think we can even tie in, or, you know, or, or anybody else licensed, certified, or otherwise authorized by law to deliver healthcare services. And we can piggyback on an existing definition of healthcare services or something like that. I mean, I think we can, um, so I, I think we can accomplish the result, but I think we're going to need to be mindful of how we're doing okay do you um do you think you have enough direction to do that or do you <laughs> i think so yeah okay. well yeah my i'm 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 with you on this i still um i'm still thinking that by listing the folks who are already listed in the bill and adding pharmacist uh accomplishes our goal but i'm let's see what you come up with i'm i'm open to this and uh we did get a letter from steve hochberg the pharmacist who dispenses these um drugs and it was a very compelling letter a very empathetic and his relationship with these patients so i'm trying to find that letter uh and i know i have it so we'll I'll um I'll keep yeah, looking for it. We I don't, don't have remember, it. I don't remember getting that. Is that is, and it's not uh, on our website if you have it. We haven't it was not put on the web page. I, I think it was sent either uh to one or more of us and it, it wasn't it was just a letter, you know, how we get letters from folks. So if I can find that letter, I will um We'll we'll get it on the web page, and you can see what he has, what he says, because I think it will help understand the relationship that um, Senator Cummings is concerned about. Okay, Jen, where are we at this point? Effective date? No. <laughs> yeah, I think okay. we're at the effective date. Unless so, there are other changes that you're interested in making. I, let's, can we can we do this? Can we go through the changes that we have made at this point or the language that we're going to look at next? Go through it from the top. And then I'm going to suggest that we take a break and ask you how long it would take to put those changes into language so we can actually see them. Let's go through one more time. You can share with us what decisions have been made and then we'll uh, take a, a break and come back. Okay, so in the first section, section 5283, which is the requirements for prescription and documentation, uh, we talked about in this these two provisions in one and two uh, that require currently require the oral request to be made in the physician's physical presence, that instead of striking that, we would add um, or by telemedicine, uh, you know, as defined in our existing statute, as long as the physician determines telemedicine to be clinically appropriate um, for medication to be self-administered, et cetera. So putting in language to that effect about uh, affirmatively authorizing telemedicine to be used here. Um, removing this language about the physical examination in five as proposed, in 12, I guess, I, I'm not sure if Wait. you, yes. Sorry, that, back to five. I think we didn't totally make a decision there. It was sort of, we put a pin in it. Okay. Um, 
No, I and thought I, we were good. I thought we were good, but go ahead. Uh, because we put it into the, we put it in context with the rest of the program, but what were you thinking, Ruth? Well, um, I was trying to figure, I was trying to look at statute to see what, what the pr whole process is to see. It, it doesn't seem quite right to me that the whole thing could be done without any physical examination. No, no I so think that's yeah. why I wanted to make sure that, that there is a, there is a part that there is a physical examination at, and, and if this is, if taking out physical here means that there's no physical examination, then that I think is problematic. No, we went back. Remember, I think Jen went back and no, I, I believe that Go taking ahead. physical, yeah. physical out here would eliminate, I, I, gotten briefly confused by the, the definition of bona fide physician patient relationship that includes a physical examination, but then that term is never used in the chapter. So that physical examination requirement doesn't come into play. Oh, So this is the only place I believe. Um, and again, this, there were so many changes in the way this the bill was, was um, approached throughout the process and, and uh, the way it ultimately turned out was through the physician lens as opposed to the laws in other states, which just kind of lay out the process. This one is done through not imposing liability on the physician if the physician does all of these things. Um, so it does not require a physical examination, as I understand it, if you take this language out. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So clarify then, uh, because we went back and looked at the a physician patient relationship that must be established uh, before any determination is made. It's not there. What are you in the, in the beginning right. of in the very beginning in the definitions, there is a definition of bona fide physician patient relationship. That is because in earlier iterations of the bill that became at 39, there had been a requirement for a bona fide physician patient relationship of, I believe at least six months or something like that. Um, before the physician would be allowed to prescribe medication. That was not included in the final version that was enacted. And so this definition of bona fide physician patient relationship that specifies that it includes a personal physical examination, because that term is never used in the chapter, it does not pull in that requirement for there to have been a personal physical examination. And so I believe the only place in, in the <clears throat> law now that requires a physical examination um, is this reference where the physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on the physician's physical examination of the patient. Okay. Well, I suppose uh, leaving it in then is reassuring that there is a physical yeah. examination. We have allowed for telemedicine. Uh, so we've allowed for telemedicine sort of later in the process when they're yeah. requesting the medication. Um, but so, if we get rid of this physical, then there would be no. There's no physical. Yeah. If we go back to, I'm looking again at the summary that Betsy Walkerman sent us. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, Jen, let's. I mean, see. I think, so, Madam Chair. Go ahead, I, go ahead, Chair. Uh, yeah. Senator Hooker, go ahead. Thank you. Um, are we talking two different physicians here? You know, the person who determines that the person is is terminally ill, and then if the patient goes to another physician, that physician just has to examine the records and then make that determination. I'm confused the, as to, you know, how many physicians right. are involved. Yeah, it may be, and it may be helpful for us to look through the, the whole list of requirements. I think um, with you getting them piecemeal here, it's hard to get a picture for what the whole process looks like. Would it be helpful to look at the language on that? Or I can redo the language on that? Well, I'm uh, let me make a suggestion that we leave physical examination in because it sounds very problematic in terms of having that mm -hmm. relationship. And, and then, um, and then let's, let's keep going through. And then Jen, 
it would be great to go through the whole thing, the whole process okay. that we have. Um, Cause I think you get, you know, it gives you a fuller picture of what's involved, which may help you decide what pieces yeah. you feel comfortable changing and what pieces you do not. Um, but, yeah. This reminds me of going through the toxic chemicals and children's products with all the rules and the two year exemptions uh, timelines. <laughs> All right, so it sounds like we're going to leave, we may be leaving physical in for now. Yeah. Um, in subdivision 12, this is the question of um, whether you want to take out this 48 hour waiting period after the last to occur. And we talked about changing the or to and to be clear about <clears throat> all of the events. Um, but I'm not sure. We talked about the, the or to the and, that one I was there on, but I'm not sure if you had made a decision about taking out the 48 hours. Uh, committee? Yeah, the 48 hours is okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay to take out? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, the I'm next one. i that to myself. Yeah, and then good. in section two, we talked about changing this proposed uh, subsection C to say no physician, nurse, pharmacist, or other individual who is licensed, certified, or otherwise authorized by law to deliver healthcare services as defined in such and such mm -hmm. in this state shall be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of this chapter. That works. Okay. Okay. So that's and good. Yeah. And then that would take effect on passage. My question for the committee is, do you want to look at the entire process now, or would you rather have Jen come back with new language and then, uh, and then look at the entire process and where this all fits? Jen, what's your preference? I think it may make more sense for you to see what the whole process looks like in case it changes your position on changes that you do or don't want to make. Okay. Yeah, I so. think that would be helpful. I agree. And and Jen, also thinking about whether or not, since the language on the bona fide relationship is not actually used, if we want to either link it in some way or get rid of it, because it's confusing. Uh, I, I don't know which is better, but <laughs> it seems silly to have it in there if it's not serving a purpose. I'm always in favor of getting rid of definitions that aren't being used um, because I agree that it can be confusing. Um, as, as I mentioned, there were a lot of moving pieces in this throughout the process. And I think there are probably a, a number of uh, tweaks that could be made, but I'm happy to look at those with you to the extent you want to do that. Okay, right, what do you, what, why don't you walk us through very quickly here? Okay. Um, and, quickly. And, this is not a quick. <laughs> No. So I will just uh, just show you sort of it hit some of the high points in the chapter as well. So there's definitions. We won't necessarily go through those right now, but there is um, right to receive information um, and and physicians are allowed to um, provide information about the, the law and the process. So then these are the requirements. Uh, physician shall not be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action if they prescribe to the patient, uh, patient with a terminal condition, medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death, and the physician affirms by documenting in the patient's medical record that all of the following occurred. So the patient made an oral request to the physician in the physician's physical presence, and we'll be adding telemedicine here for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death. Not fewer than 15 days after the first oral request, the patient made a second oral request in the physician's physical presence. Again, we'll be adding or by telemedicine. At the time of the second oral request, the physician offered the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. The patient made a written request for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death that was signed by the patient in the presence of two or more witnesses who are not interested persons, that term is defined in the definition section, who are at least 18 years of age 
and who signed and affirmed that the patient appeared to understand the nature of the document and to be free from duress or undue influence at the time the request was signed. The physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on the physicians, and this is where that physical examination piece is in there, physical examination of the patient and review of the patient's relevant medical records. So these are the physician determined that the patient also was capable, was making an informed decision, had made a voluntary request for medication to hasten their death, and was a Vermont resident. And the physician informed the patient in per, oh, this one is in person as well. So we may, I hadn't actually noticed that one. That's why it's good we're going through it. So we may need to add um, or by telemedicine there. Um, both verbally and in writing of all of the following. So the physician informs the patient of the patient's medical diagnosis, the patient's prognosis, including acknowledging that the physician's prediction of the patient's life expectancy was an estimate based on the physician's best medical judgment and was not a guarantee of the actual time remaining in the patient's life and that the patient could live longer than the time predicted. The range of treatment options appropriate for the patient and the patient's diagnosis. If the patient was not enrolled in hospice care, all feasible end-of-life services, including palliative care, comfort care, hospice care, and pain control. The, the range of possible results, including potential risks associated with taking the medication to be prescribed, and the probable result of taking the medication to be prescribed. Number seven is that the physician referred the patient to a second physician, so here's the second physician, for medical confirmation of the diagnosis, prognosis, and a determination that the patient was capable, was acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. Number eight, the physician either verified that the patient did not have impaired judgment or referred the patient for an evaluation by a psychiatrist, psychologist, or clinical social worker licensed in Vermont for confirmation that the patient was capable and did not have impaired judgment. If applicable, the physician consulted with the patient's primary care physician with the patient's consent. The physician informed the patient that the patient may rescind the request at any time and in any manner and offered the patient an opportunity to rescind after the patient's second oral request. The physician ensured that all required steps were carried out in accordance with this section and confirmed immediately prior to writing the prescription for medication that the patient was making an informed decision. The physician wrote the prescription no fewer than 48 hours, and that's the piece talking about taking out, after the last to occur of the following events, the patient's written request for medication to hasten their own death, the patient's second oral request, or the physicians offering the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. So again, we're talking about changing that or to an and. Jen, sorry yep. to interrupt. Since mm -hmm. we're since we're doing this um, in an A, I, I believe you all have a um, way to make things non-gender specific. Uh, yes, I can go through. I mean, we can do that in. All of these, I think it's throughout here that there's a his or her own death, even in the, maybe it was in the first, anyway. Yes, I can make that gender neutral if you'd like. Yeah, I lost cards. That's okay with everyone. We might as well since we're- Yeah, good catch. Updating. Good catch. Actually, it's not gender neutrality. It's non-gendered. Non-gender. And yes, we are making affirmative efforts to uh, remove gendered language throughout the DSA. Okay, uh, number 13, the physician either dispensed the medication directly, provided that at the time the physician dispensed the medication, there's another gendered language, the physician was licensed to dispense medication in Vermont, had a current DEA certificate, and complied with any applicable administrative rules. So the physician either dispenses it, dispensed it directly or with the patient's written consent contacted a pharmacist and informed the pharmacist of the prescription and delivered the written prescription personally or by mail or fax to the pharmacist who dispensed the medication to the patient 
the physician or an expressly identified agent of the patient. The physician recorded and filed the following in the patient's medical record. Wait, Jen, the date. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. By fax, um, does that would that include um, through a, med, a you know a online medical record or however prescriptions are done electronically now? Not the way it's written. I don't know if there is a need or interest in changing that. Well, uh, I think the idea was put, to have something. I think the idea was to have a, a physical yeah. paper record. So hands. it's either I see. delivered, I see. mailed, or faxed. I see. Okay. That's fine then. Number 14 is that the physician recorded and filed the following in the patient's medical record. The date time and wording of all oral requests of the patient for medication to hasten their death. Um, all written requests, so the date, time and wording of all the oral requests is A, all written requests by the patient for the medication and B, the physician's diagnosis, prognosis and basis for the determination that the patient was capable, was acting voluntarily and had made an informed decision. The second physician's diagnosis, prognosis, and verification that the patient was capable, was acting voluntarily, and had made an informed decision. The physician's attestation that the patient was enrolled in hospice care at the time of the oral and written requests for medication to hasten their death, or that the physician informed the patient of all feasible end-of-life services. The physician's verification that the patient either did not have impaired judgment or that the physician referred the patient for an evaluation and the person conducting the evaluation has determined that the patient did not have impaired judgment. A report of the outcome and determinations made during any evaluation which the patient may have received. The date, time, and wording of the physician's offer to the patient to rescind the request for medication at the time of the second oral request and a note by the physician indicating that all of the requirements un under this section were satisfied and describing all of the steps taken to carry out the request, including a notation of the medication prescribed. And finally, after writing the prescription, the physician promptly filed a report with the Department of Health documenting completion of all of the requirements under this section. And then it specifies that the section shall not be construed to limit civil or criminal liability for gross negligence, recklessness, or intentional misconduct. Then we have that duty to aid, uh, that it's okay that the, somebody who is self-administering a lethal dose of medication is not a person exposed to grave physical harm, and nobody is subject, will be subject to liability solely for being present when the patient took the medication or for not acting to prevent it. And we have the limitations on actions provision that we talked about, including adding some new language. Um, there is an existing exception that allows a healthcare facility to prohibit a physician for writing a prescription um, uh, of a medication intended to be lethal for a patient who is a resident on the, in the facility and intends to use it on the facility's premises as long as the facility is notified the physician in writing of its policy um, and notwithstanding those limitations on liability, any physician who violates a policy established by a healthcare facility under this section may be subject to sanctions otherwise allowable. Can I ask a question about that, Jen? Mm -hmm. it was I don't know if you can answer, but was the intent of that so that if there was, for example, a nursing home that didn't want this law to be used in their nursing home, they could say, we don't do this here, basically. <laughs> you, you that can't that is it. my understanding. I can't okay. speak to intent, but that is my understanding is that this language would allow a facility to say, we don't do that here. Got it. You can't, okay. like, you can't write that prescription and have it be used here. Got it. Okay. That was actually yep. a, that was actually a, a it wasn't a long conversation, but it certainly was a conversation during the development of the bill of the original. Essentially, allowing a facility to exempt out of yes, or, yeah. yeah, right, allowing a facility to opt out. Um, 
5287 says nobody can be denied benefits under a life insurance policy for actions taken in accordance with this chapter um, and that medical malpractice insurance and, and rates cannot be conditioned upon or affected by whether the physician is willing or unwilling to participate in acting under this chapter. Um, there had been concern about palliative sedation. So the chapter um, shall not limit or otherwise affect providing, administering, or receiving palliative sedation consistent with accepted medical standards. Um, palliative sedation is giving somebody um, palliative, I can't remember if, it's, if it is defined here, it'd be very helpful if it is, otherwise we're going on my recollection. No, it's um, administering uh, palliative medication to uh, make somebody comfortable recognizing that there is a, the potential that the dosage could be um, fatal, but with, without that being the primary intent. So the intent is to make the person um, comfortable. Intent is not to uh, cause the person's death, but it, it is always a possibility. Um, and there was concern that people would be reluctant or providers would be reluctant to provide a sufficient amount of palliative um, medication if there were concerns that it could be considered a lethal dose of medication. Uh, there's a requirement that the Department of Health adopt rules providing for the safe disposal of unused medications, recognizing that these are medications um, that can have the, that are intended to have the effect of causing death. And if they were not used, um, there needed to be a way to dispose of them safely. Then there's language, um, statutory construction language saying nothing in this chapter shall be construed to authorize a physician or anyone else to end a patient's life by lethal injection, mercy killing, or active euthanasia. And then action taken in accordance with this chapter shall not be construed for any purpose to constitute suicide, assisted suicide, mercy killing, or homicide under the law. And it should not be construed to conflict with a provision of the Affordable Care Act that also, as I recall, uh, prohibited those activities. Then there was a uh, provision added a couple of years later requiring the health department to adopt rules to facilitate collecting information regarding compliance with the chapter, including identifying patients who filled prescriptions written pursuant to this chapter, and that information would be confidential and, and exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act. And then this subsection B is the requirement uh, that the health department generate a biennial statistical report of the information collected under subsection A in a manner that complies with HIPAA. So that is why you get that report that you uh, have just gotten this year um, that tells how many people use the, this process, um, what the underlying conditions were, et cetera. So that is the language of the existing law. Okay, questions for Jen. Go ahead, Ruth, uh, Senator Hardy, go ahead. Um, so that, I, I, going back to that subsection A under paragraph five, um, the one that we sort of had up in the air. It, it's unclear to me, even after going through that, the order of steps. And you know, one of the things we're we're trying to do is to, uh, well, with the bill, is to make it so that there isn't necessarily a requirement for physical um, examination when they're prescribing medication. So if um, is it your understanding that this the, the this determination that a patient is suffering a terminal condition takes place first? <laughs> first, beyond like that's the first step, and then there's the the steps of deter, of requesting the medication. Um, I think not necessarily. I, I mean, I think the patient can make the oral request, and and that can trigger the. For the physician to have to determine that the patient is suffering a terminal condition. I mean, depending on the, the relationship between the patient and the physician, that may already be information that is known to the physician, or it may not. It may be something that they have to determine because that request has been made. Yeah. So that's where it gets complicated because one of the, 
you know, one of the things we heard in testimony is that by the time a patient requests this um, medication, they could be already so sick that traveling to see a physician is difficult and therefore the need for telemedicine is important. So if we don't get rid of the physical here, we may be sort of defeating the purpose. <laughs> um, but it does seem uh, strange that there would be no physical examination yeah. at any point by a physician. So is there, I mean, presumably they would have had physical um, examination by their physician who's caring for them for their terminal illness. Like if they have cancer, their oncologist, their primary care physician um, would have um, so if you did a, a physical examination, just a second. Um, so is there a way we could link back to that? You know what I mean? So that, that we're not preventing, we're not undoing what we're trying to do at the same time, but also ensuring that at some point in the process, there has been a physical examination. Yes, I mean, I, I think you could certainly add something in um, as part of the, the determination that the patient was suffering a, a terminal condition, that if this physician had not done a physical examination, that they have consulted with a physician who has, or, you know, or something yeah. to that effect. Look, look, at, look at the, I think the summary that Betsy Walkerman has provided is pretty clear. And but that's not the law, Ginny. I'm no, sorry. I I'm trying understand to that. Let me finish. <laughs> Let me finish. Let me finish. And what it reflects is what actually happens within the medical community. So the question is that then on a bona fide physician patient relationship, that that's the question I think that we're asking here is, is there a bona fide physician patient relationship? Has that exam taken place? And is this a person who does, who knows the patient? So it, given that we understand how physicians work in this situation, in particular, uh, Dr. Barnard and her um, testimony, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't put a link in saying that it says before the physician can write the prescription, the following steps must be taken. They have to confirm that the, that the patient meets Act 39 requirements. And it's in there, and perhaps we could use the term bona fide physician patient relationship. I, and I don't know what else we could say, and unless you want to say a physical exam at that point is required. And then you could take the physical exam out later when the person, it, it, but we don't know if the person is already at a stage where they can't get in the car and drive to the doctor's office. So it's called the paradox. And Senator Cummings has her hand up and then Senator Hardy. Okay. Just looking back at my experience, once you have someone that is terminally ill, there are so many doctors and professionals involved. Um, my daughter saw, well, she didn't really have primary care because our the people that the, had been doing primary care for years said they weren't doing it anymore. They were only going to do oncology. So she had seen the ner her new nurse practitioner, I think, once before COVID hit. Um, but that's where the original diagnosis came from. Then there was the oncologist, there was the pulmonologist, there was the emergency room doctor. There were the hospitalists when you went in. Then there was the OBGYN surgeon. Then when the tissues didn't come back as an OBGYN issue, um, there were several surgeons uh, palliative care doctors in the hospital. There were hospice workers from home health, any of whom could say they had a doctor patient relationship. Um, but there's a medical record out there somewhere 
Um, but I don't, I think what we want is that whichever doctor ends up doing it is a doctor that has a relationship with the patient. I'm concerned, and I think the original concern was you could just do dial a doctor, um, you know, and you would have one do doctor that was known that, oh, well, if you just go in and tell him, you know, he'll write the prescription. And so you were trying to, I remember those discussions, something about here and walk down the hall and the partner in the same office will say, yeah, you're sound mind. Um, for the record, I didn't vote for this bill originally, um, but it, I don't know that we can define it because in reality, the way the minute you hit the hospital, all your other doctors are out of it and you're in the hands of hospitalists. Um, to find the old kind of, you know, I could have said for my doctor, she's my doctor. She was my doctor for 30 years. Um, and she would come see you in the hospital. That doesn't happen anymore. To find a doctor that really knows you in these circumstances, I think would be a rarity. There's just too too much specialization. And I don't know how you deal with that. Well, you know, I think currently uh, we have had a good experience in our state with this program. And we did hear from Dr. Barnard how the doctor-patient relationship uh, is formed. So I'm, I'm very, I'm concerned that we don't want to go too, we don't want to go backwards and, or too far into the underlying statute, but we do want to be sure that we're clear on what's happening. Senator Hardy, go ahead. Thank you, Senator Lyons, and thank you, Senator Cummings, for sharing what I know is a difficult experience. Um, I think, Jen, on that section that we're, that we're talking about, 5A, um, it might work to just change the the to an A <laughs> so that it's was suffering a terminal condition based on a physician's physical examination. So that would imply that a previous physical examination that diagnosed the patient had been in person, but the current physician that may be providing the medication wouldn't necessarily have to have done that physical examination. Does that make sense? And it seems like a simple change. But Nothing's ever simple, but it sounds really good. <laughs> well, I mean, simple in that it's a supporting change, but it might get to our concerns that there will have been a physical examination, but it doesn't necessarily have to be within this really tight process at the end when somebody's really suffering. And, and I think that given the fact that um, bona fide physical physician patient relationship is never really used in the statute, it, it may be best to actually get rid of it so there's not confusion, but I don't want that to become controversial to get rid of that. It, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I agree with you, but I, it's also the last thing you said is it could become another hot issue. We'll think about it. Senator, Senator Cummings. Could we say a physical examination somewhere in this chain and confirmed by the medical record? Right. And, that, and that's actually in the, I think, in the It is bill, in there already, Anne, actually. They that's do a medical history that determines that, and they, they examine the patient and their medical history to determine um, the patient's status. Uh, yeah. status that's yeah. in there so okay. it's, right it's, so the language of 5a currently is is the physician determined that the patient was suffering a terminal condition based on and we might be changing that to based on a physician's physical examination of the patient maybe we say and the physician's 
review of the patient's medical relevant medical records. Maybe we even flip those so it's clear that it's this physician who's doing the review of the patient's relevant medical records and a physician who did the physical examination. Oh, Does that, that is sense? so good. Yeah. Good work, Senator Hardy. Trying to get to yes here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that the last thing or not? Where, where yes. are we? I think so. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. All right. It is, it, it is, it is 1120 uh, before Senator Hardy has a comment. Um, Jen, how long would it take you to put together uh, a new iteration? Um. I, I can probably make it pretty quick. Okay. Maybe 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Well, let's do that. Let's, let's, let's ask for you, please, to do that. It would be great. And then we'll come back and look at it. And then we will, uh, we, we, are not, we won't vote, but we'll, we'll take a chance. We'll take some time overnight uh, to consider it. And then perhaps great. tomorrow we'll be able to vote on the bill. We'll, we'll have some time after we meet with the House. I think, although our schedules. So that's are great. I will bring you an unedited version and I'll get it edited while you're considering. Okay. Senator Hardy. That's great. I was just going to say one added benefit of Jen um, updating the gender language is that it would, it will have more language in the bill. So it will probably be less confusing because there'll be more, it will be less out of context. Yes. Yeah, so are you wanting me to make the changes throughout the chapter or just in the sections we're already working with? I, let's, let's just do the sections we're working with. If you do it oh. throughout the bill, then it opens up the entire bill for scrutiny and amendments and everything else. And I know, frankly, I know that whichever senator presents us on the floor is going to do a great job. So, All right, let's, um, let, uh, Aaron, let's go off YouTube. We're on break. Uh, for what, until 1140, Jen?